Okay, I have to ask a couple things here and then show you one. One is I figured out now what all the random problems will be. And I could sort them into the no calculator problems and give you that test separately, as you agreed earlier was a good idea, so that the final exam wouldn't have to have those problems on it and be too long. And wouldn't have to have a separate no calculator section and then you turn that in and I get, let you have your calculator and all that baloney. So that's pretty good. Um, and uh, is there a, again, because of Monday holidays and possible snow and stuff, I'd rather not like spend a whole, half of a class time saying here is a 40 minute no calculator math thing sometime this term. Is it something that people could do if I left it in the MRC or could we do it after class one day or should we actually use class time on this? The, the no calculator problems, yeah. So like a test. Yeah, it would be a test. It would be something you could take oh, yeah. again. I, I like the whole thing over there. But because, so it would know. be after class time. That's what I'm wondering. Uh, yeah. I have work. I have. I go straight to work. Everyone, yeah, okay. I, I, if there's, I, I, if there's I, 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 accommodation. So okay. So we'll do it during class then, and it's not like we're ready for it yet. We still have another <laughs> fraction. <laughs> <issue>. <laughs> I'm like, I'm so but someday we'll do it during class, and I'll use the MRC for people who either need extra time or people who want to take it a second or third time because they didn't do it the first time. So, so two yeah. questions, is there an actual um, date that you will assign the first test? The, the no calculator one? Yeah. Yeah, but I don't know what it is. It depends on how fast we go through material when we get done with fraction arithmetic. No, like so that. Sure it looks like a review. Yes. Yeah. The whole point of this tests page is that if you click on it, then all I'm gonna give you is something that's like this. And this isn't done yet. Um, but every time you reload the page, the numbers have changed and you get an answer key so you can see how you're doing. So it will not be a surprise. It will look just like one of these. For both the no calculator problems and for your final, which might have a few of these on because they're important, but not all of them. Um, it's just too long. And so what I need to do is add a little more JavaScript randomness so that, oh, you know, numbers 14 and 15 about decimal point scoots it's gonna randomly give you one of those, not both of them. So you need to prep how to do both of them because you don't know which one it will be. But the slot on the test is just one of those two items, just so that it doesn't take too long when you're sitting here. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But this right now is something you could use to start studying if you panic, but no, don't look at this. We're not there yet. We haven't you'll done give, a lot of these things yet. You'll give so. us like a couple days yes. before. Yes, yes. You know things aren't due as early as you're used to in this class. So. Okay, the other thing I want to do is torture you with a pop quiz. Okay, pop quiz number one. I have to like move, can I move myself off the screen? There we go. Can anyone do any of these? Perfect. Anyone do diagramming sentences in elementary school? I did, but I'm really old. Uh, no. Uh, I don't remember elementary school. Uh, I don't remember learning any of this. Oh. <laughs> you didn't do sentence things. Anyone recognize the quotation as number three? Like, unless it's Shakespeare, then no. It's not Shakespeare. Then no. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me, let me, let me read. What does this have to do? Let me read. I can't. Because I see number four, and I like The Witcher. So, hold on. So, I got to reword number three, you said? This quotation makes a modern English and explains historical understanding. But tack it not, I pray you in the end. This is the point to speak in short and find Okay. So why I'm showing you this, obviously this is not a real pop quiz because it is. I hope not. I will fail. I will fail. I should just walk out. So it's probably true that no one can do any of these four. 
Maybe even if we went through all of building 16 now, we'd not find anyone who could do even one of these. <laughs> what this has to do with math, it's everything. This is both a joke and nothing to do with math, and it's also serious and everything to do with math. So I have an eight-year-old that read a lot this morning. My eight-year-old would say he's a reader. People tell him he's a reader. For a while, he spent a lot of time learning to read. And now he is switched and he's, as they say, reading to learn. He's using reading to answer his own problems and questions he gets in real life. What's the difference between a band and an orchestra anyway? Um, and people have like clapped for him. Yay, you are a good reader. <laughs> now it doesn't mean he will never use phonics again. If he opens a chemistry textbook someday, he's going to be sounding out words syllable by syllable. It doesn't mean he can answer any of these things. There's certainly more to English and literature than what he can read in third grade. But the point is, we feel like we're readers, even though we can't do any of these things. No one feels like you have to understand. This is Chaucer, the Canterbury Tales. You don't have to understand all of that to be a reader. For some reason, it is different in the world of math. When I go up to here and here. So here's the chart of the LCC math sequence, how the different courses fit together. And for some reason, you made it to LCC and no one has ever told you in your life, by the way, good job, you are a mather. <laughs> not even a word. It's not even a word. Anything. Something is wrong, right? <laughs> you are probably pretty good at using math to budget your checkbook if you do that, or compare prices in the grocery store, or do some household carpentry, or all of these other things, right? You have moved on from learning math skills to using math in real life, just like being a reader was that progression. But it was never mentioned to you, it was never celebrated. What people instead focused on was this relentless pursuit of climbing the ladder of math courses, and no one even told you where the goal was. When do you get to be a mather if that's somehow on this page? Right? Who knows? What does it mean to be good at math? So the point of this pop quiz is that even if you don't consider yourself a mather now, by the time you're done with Math 20, you will be. You will be able to do all the basic skills you need for real life things. Right? Most people never use algebra in real life. And that doesn't mean algebra is worthless. Most people never use what they learned about ancient Egypt in real life, and that was still good to study. But um, what it means to be someone that uses math, that you will be able to do that. It's also an advertisement. If you go to our class website again and jump to Math 25, Okay, keep it real, by the way, as a reference to Gracie Jiu Jitsu. But imagine a class about art where you learn about lots of paintings and famous painters and styles of painting and historical influences of painters, but you never picked up a brush. That would be an art appreciation class, right? It's not an art class, we're not making. Or imagine a class about music where you listen to famous songs and learn about composers and orchestras and styles of music all around the world but you never actually wrote any notes or composed or used an instrument to play anything. That would be music appreciation, right? Not a music class. So pretty much everyone here has never actually had a math class. You've had math appreciation classes and people lied to you and told them to you that they were math classes. You've done old problems other people made and already solved and they care about more than you. And you look at that, that's like art appreciation or music appreciation, right? You haven't made up your own personal things. The things you have, have been outside of school. When you're wondering, is it better if I buy a house or rent? Or how many presents can I afford to get my family this holiday season? Or what kind of vacation would make me happy considering how much money I have? Those are all real things that use math to help you make not necessarily the right answer that someone could grade because it's the only one that's right, but an informed answer. It's better than if you didn't think about those things using math, right? So you've used math, but no one has let you really do that in the classroom. No one has taught you about how that is in the classroom, the way you keep using books after you learn to read. 
It would be stupid if, like, hey, third grade, we learned to read. No more books in school. We're done with that. And for some reason, that's how we do math. Once you learn to use math, all the interesting real life stuff happens outside of the classroom. So that's what Math 25 is about. So if you aren't sure what to do and want to learn how to like save for retirement and not suck in old age, then Math 25 is a good class. Maybe not next term. You might have other things going on in your life but it's probably well worth the time and money to figure out a little bit more than this class about how to use math in real life to make good decisions and understand the world around you and things like that. If you want to look at the topics, then you can do that. But uh, anyway, it's right by our website. There you go. So that's your encouraging thing for today, that you are closer to being a mather, whatever that is, than you realize. And maybe you already are. Okay, now let's actually do math skills. So questions about any homework so far, rounding, fractions, percents, not measurement. We haven't actually done any measurement problems yet. Yes. Can we go for the number 10 and subtraction The Jorgensen one? Yes, yeah. we will always have to do that sometime. How many people have tried that one? The last one of yeah. only a few? Have you got it right? Let me start it, but not finish it. And Friday, we can finish it if we, if you want, which I'm sure you will. So, but there's enough to it. I'm hesitant to give it all the way at once. Um, where am I trying to put it? Yeah. Oh, I scrolled too far. Rounding. This one? Yep. Oh, it's not the one I'm thinking of. Okay, this one I'll just do one of them and then we can do the other half Friday if you want. But this isn't the interesting one I thought about. Never mind. Okay, we're wanting to compare things. So we talked about ratios where you write things as fractions whether or not they are. We talked about rates where you put some labels on them so you keep track better of what's on top and what's on bottom. And then we talked about unit rates where you go top divided by bottom to make it so the denominator is one. So we're going to do those three things. So we have 54, okay, 54 ounces. Whoops, not 50, 54 ounces. And $4.79. And I'm actually going to write that funny like $4.79. Why am I putting the dollar sign on the right hand side? You'll see that later on I'm going to do some things where the labels cancel. So I'm just sort of getting the good habit of putting all the words on the right hand side of my rates. And yeah, in normal life we put the dollar sign on this side, but it's okay. This will work. Okay, so I could also write it upside down. Nothing wrong with either of those. Some people like one, some people like the other. I'm gonna do them both because I can't make everyone happy. Some people in this room will think the top is the right way. Some people will think the top looks freaky and unnatural, why aren't I doing it the bottom way? So I will just do both. Okay, I wanna to do top divided by bottom to make a unit rate. Okay, what is that now? 54 divided by 479. I'm going to round. Let 
but ask the other one. Okay, is everyone happy with one over the other? If my brain likes the top method, I'm wondering how many ounces do I get per dollar? As I can go into the gas station, I hand the attendant a one dollar bill and want as heavy a bag of whatever this is, soup, as heavy a can of soup as I can get for a dollar. If I'm comparing brand M and brand T, will I pick the one with the bigger or smaller number here? Smaller. Oh, no, bigger. If I'm looking for how many ounces I get per dollar for one dollar, I want the most soup per dollar. So I do the same thing for the brand T numbers and pick the bigger of the two numbers. If I'm this way and I put dollars on top, or dollars first when I divide, then I get about nine cents per ounce, 0 0.09 dollars per ounce. And that's the one Michelle said, when I compare them with the other one, I want the smaller one. Or so we're talking like cents per ounce. That's right. This would be a bizarre kind of store that sold just an ounce of soup at a time. But if they did, you'd want to pay as little as possible for it. So you'd want the smaller of the two. So either style works, pick only one. Don't do both because that would be repetitive. But do you think the bigger number being the better buy makes sense? Is that how your brain works? Or do you think the smaller number being the better buy makes more sense? Because that's how your brain works. So pick one and do it for both pairs of numbers. And um, there you go. Did that answer your question well enough? OK. I'll put brand T down at the bottom just to remind everyone that we're not done yet. Okay, yes. I find that, like, for me, anytime it's a work problem, I just confuse myself with that. I don't know why. We'll go through word problems more soon, but not quite yet. I think that in both homeworks, those are the ones that I get wrong. Mm -hmm. The problem with word problems is that doing things with only one number at a time is limits how we can talk about word problems in general. So we'll get to that one. Does it make sense once you see it? Case once by case? I see it, and mm -hmm. then when I go home and try to do it, I like to look for complicated. And then when I ask about it in class, I'm like, oh. No. Yeah, don't make it too complicated. But it's not really helpful when I say that. <laughs> OK, other homework problems. This was a good one. So the, the rule of the fours, it's just if the last two numbers is developed as a goal by four, then it's then four will go into it. That's yes. all it's saying. Uh -huh. So if it is thirty million four hundred twenty-seven thousand and eighty, then yes, four goes yes. into eighty. Yeah. So just all and then just like three, you just add up all the numbers and then it goes into that. So. Yes. Okay, well, let's move on to new stuff if we're ready. Does that mean that homework's done? Um, does that mean that we just had a question about fractions? Yeah, fractions can't be due yet because we just had a question about that. So, so you have maybe a week from Friday. Okay, there we go. Okay, so we ended class on Wednesday talking about measurement units and their history. 
This was the relaxing part where we didn't actually do any arithmetic. You just sort of got to listen to silly stories about measurement units. The thing I needed to go over again was the cooking measurements. Right? So the rule in Math 20 for tests is that anything that crosses over between standard and SI units, we will always give you those conversion rates. So how many meters makes a foot? How many feet make a meter? How many gallons are in a liter? Anything that mixes up standard and SI, then we will give you those rates. You don't have to memorize them. They'll be there on the paper. Anything that stays within one unit um, system, you have to memorize. So how many feet are in a mile? You'll have to memorize the 5,280 if you haven't done that yet. How many feet are in a yard? Three feet in a yard, you need to know that. We haven't talked about SI units particularly yet. We will do that today. For most Math 20 students, then feet in a mile, the 5,280, you might need to memorize. And then the other thing that people sometimes need to memorize is the cooking units, if you're not someone that has used them a bunch yourself. Other people know these already, and that's great too. So the eight ounces is a cup, two cups is a pint, two pints is a quart, and four quarts is a gallon. The way to remember these is with a cute picture. So we take our gallon and write it like a box. Imagine this is like a fish tank that holds a gallon or something like that. If we chop it into four pieces, we get quarts. Why are they named quarts? Because they're quarters. So four quarts and a gallon. If we chop those in half, we get a pint. You might know pints from buying like heavy cream and things like that. A cup is that tiny little box you got milk in in elementary school. So two pints is a cup. The cup, the pints are like twice as big as a cup. So it's two pints. Right? So see them at the grocery store shelf. There are eight ounces in a cup, which sounds a little funny because there are 16 ounces in a pound. So why do we have for weight 16 ounces in a pound, but for volume, the cup is eight, right? And the answer is because of a lady in Boston. For most of history, if you read old cookbooks, then there wasn't a such thing as a cup precisely defined. The cup was just you took one of your cups and scooped flour and stuff. But there was somebody that started the Boston School of Cooking and decided that this was all too sloppy and artistic and we needed to make a science out of it. And she invented the teaspoon, tablespoon sets that we all have today and a cup was exactly this amount of half a pint and things like that. So there we go. Cups are newer than pints as being an officially defined thing. So the pint is 16 ounces. It does match the 16 ounces in a pound for weight. While we're staring at this, let's scroll down a little more. You can put them all together. The gallon is the big thing. The quart is the quarter. Split the quart into two pints, split the pints into two cups. A bunch of you, when I give you a, your first test, whenever that happens to be, you're just gonna draw this on the top corner of your scratch paper as soon as I say go, and then you'll have it there. Right? Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna hide what's at the little one. Why do we say mind your P's and Q's? Anyone know that while we're talking about things? I will tell you because then you can tell your friends and entertain them. So back in the old days when you know, Sheila was living in London, didn't have a fireplace of her own in her house because that was too expensive. She'd go to the pub and stay warm at night until bedtime. And it wasn't payday yet. So back on the wall behind the bar, the bartender had a chalkboard and would put her name. And every time she ordered more beer would put P's and Q's for pints and quarts. So mind your P's and Q's meant don't rack up too big a bar bill before payday, which is kind of funny because now we tell it to like little kids, but anyway. 
As another note, there is something called a dry court, which I don't want to talk about, but it's used for agriculture. And we are in the grass seed capital of the world in the Willamette Valley. So some of you might have family that uses dry court all the time, but no, not in math money. Needless complication. Uh, I just realized I forgot to check the sound settings. I, okay, I apologize if the video will have terrible sound quality until now, but we'll see. Okay, so that's the end of the measurement unit stuff. Now we're gonna actually use it and do some arithmetic. What happens when we convert between measurement units? I'll make this big and then we'll look at some cases. We either multiply or divide. How many feet are in 30 inches? Are we gonna multiply or divide? Multiply. So we're gonna do a times 12. That seems kind of big. I don't think 30 inches is 360 feet. So it must be the other one. How do we know which it is? In the case of 30 inches becoming feet, we're taking these little inches and we're sort of grouping them together. We're taking 12 and we're sticking them together with paste to make a one foot ruler. And then we're taking another 12 and sticking them all together. So division is we're trying to make piles of the same size. We talked about that way back in the first day. One way of thinking about division is making piles of the same size. If we're going the other way, how many inches are in 7.5 feet? Unsurprisingly, that's the other way. So we're going to multiply. That's, we're taking seven one foot long yardsticks and shattering them into little pieces, splitting them apart into little one inch bits of wood and making lots of copies of something is what multiplying does. So on a math test, our brain likes to shut down and we make silly mistakes. So what's the easy thing to remember? What do you cram for your test so that you don't do the wrong one? Well, let's look at this. When we went from a bigger measurement to a smaller one, like inches smaller to feet bigger, right? so smaller to bigger we divide. When we're going the other way, bigger to smaller, then we multiply. I'm going to scroll down just a tiny bit. There we go. We'll call these one step unit conversions because either way, whether we're multiplying or dividing, we can get to our answer in only one step. Quite a bit later in the term, we'll get to measurement conversions that aren't one step. It takes two steps or more steps. But for now, we're just doing the one step one. I'm not quite sure I like how I typed this. Maybe we should say for here, smaller to bigger is divide bigger to smaller. I think 
my phrasing was bad. Anyway. Okay, ready to try it a bunch? You can multiply, you can divide. So how many inches are in 5.7 feet? Are we gonna multiply or divide? So we're going from feet two inches, from the bigger to the smaller. So no, that one is the multiply. And what are we multiplying by? 12, 12 inches and a foot. Oh, okay. So we multiply in feet by foot, or just by right? Yeah, we're multiplying. For um, A, so we're multiplying the power of those by 12. Right. Yeah, Imagine that we're taking five one foot measure, um, rulers and breaking them into 12 pieces, then we'd have 60 pieces, and then three quarters of the foot would be the last nine inches. That line is a little better. Okay, this way, 198 inches. I like putting the label here so it's clear which we're starting with. So we're starting with something smaller and getting to the bigger unit. Divide. And again, it's 12 because of 12 inches and feet. Okay, you try the other four, compare it with your neighbor. In a moment, I will do them on the board and catch up to you. Yes? Well, there's big calculator and non calculator. Calculator is great. Oh, I made one like on the test. When they on the test, yeah. These these will be calculator, these will be calculator friendly. So, oh, take out paper. Try these yourselves. This is not a spectator sport. <laughs> Anyone need an extra calculator today? Because they forgot one. I see. Yeah. Start with just the numbers for a couple of these. How many cups are in a gallon? Don't tell me times are divided. Just what's the number part going to be for you? And the picture we just looked at? 16. Yeah. And then how many ounces are in a pound? Also 16 ounces. So all of these are going to be 16s. I just don't want people to not do the arithmetic because they can't remember if that's 16 or 8. Or
Okay, number C, times or divide? Multiply 192. Multiply and 192. And David, yeah, everyone agree with David? Yeah. We're going from a big thing to a small thing, so we're multiplying. Okay, so unsurprisingly, the next one divide will be divided. What's the answer? 2.5. 2.5, okay. So we're going from the small thing to the big thing, so we divide. Okay, C, which was the bigger one, the pounds or the ounces? Pounds is bigger. So we're going from bigger to smaller, so... Divide. Divide. Multiply, and it's 234. 234? Okay, I did that right. Mm -hmm. Divide by 16. 152 times 16 is 234. 2,442. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I, I said it short, sorry. 234. <laughs> so the next one's divide. The next one is divide. We're going from a small thing to a bigger thing, so we're dividing. Clearly, it's cooking. I just cheat up when measuring things. <laughs> <laughs> it tells it doesn't have to be a <laughs> For cooking? Wow. So. Okay, questions about this? So it's a little bit like riding a bicycle. If you have to stop and think, wait, which is bigger, cups or gallons, then you need a little more practice because you want that to be fast. But that's all you have to do is remember which is bigger very quickly. And then you'll know whether you're multiplying or dividing. Yes. It's, it's easier for us in the U.S. because we use cups, gallons, and all that inches and feet. Right. If you were to do it in the other right. European I, 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 version, it'd be more difficult. No, actually, SI units are much easier. We're about to get to that. So. Well, not just Europe, but Asia, too. I bought this cookbook that was, I don't know if it was like from China or Singapore or whatever, but all the units were in metric. We're also a little unusual in America of how much we do cooking with volume. If you go to a culinary place, that's all, it's all weight. You use pounds of eggs and milk and things. But in a lot of countries, your little electric kitchen scale is much more important than in the US. So. OK. So we've looked at the standard units, the American units. We've looked at how to convert things back and forth. Let's talk about the prefixes for SI a little more, metric systems we sloppily call them. We saw a few of them in the story about measurement units. A kilogram was a thousand grams because a little cube, one centimeter on a side, if you filled it with water and weighed it, that amount of weight was the gram. And that was okay in the lab, but that was just not good for people and backpacks and other things you want to measure in real life. So we needed a thousand of those to make a kilogram, and that's what we normally would talk about. The milliliter was a liter divided by a thousand, and a millimeter was a meter divided by a thousand. So there was the pattern that milla in front means take this thing and divide it by a thousand. And then the centimeter was the meter divided by 100. So a centi in front of something is hinting at this pattern, too, that will divide it by 100. So here's a, the bigger list. There are other prefixes we are about to see, but these are the ones you care about. These are the ones you need to memorize. Oh, we had to memorize. Yes, so we can memorize be. these, because this is staying in SI units. And anything that stays from SI to SI, you need to know, just like anything that stays in standard to standard. So kilo anything means a thousand. You have the plane unit, whatever it is, meters, grams, meters. 
then you have sent in of a hundred milla of a thousand. And then there's another one that we use a lot in nursing and a bunch of people here might be going into nursing. So we'll talk about micro, which is a million micrograms for medicine. Okay, a little more writing. This will make more sense once you see it in action. In fact, let's do one right now. Let's say that 4.8 kilograms is how many grams? So, Kilo means a thousand, so I'm going to do in a thousand. If we're going from the bigger thing to the smaller thing, do we multiply or divide? Multiply. multiply. So times a thousand will be three scoots, so we'll get 4,800. What if we had um, 58? Milligrams is how many grams? So milla is about 1,000. Milla is smaller. We're going from the smaller thing to the big thing. So we'll divide. Okay, this is too much work. It already looks a little easier because we're just doing decimal point scoops instead of playing with 16 on our calculator. But it gets even better. So here is the complete list. Whatever I'm measuring would go where the unit is. So this could be a meter or a gram or a liter. Those are the ones we'll be using. And then if we had 10 of those, it would be a deca something. A hundred would be a hecto something, and a thousand we just saw was the kilo something. Yeah. In this country, you'll never hear decam meters or hectograms, so we're going to ignore those. Similarly, the tenth, desit, yeah, you have to pronounce it too carefully to not be a deca, and no one cares, so we're going to skip that one. And we have centa and milla. What's kind of freaky is there's no name for the ten thousand and hundred thousand. It's just sort of space placeholders, and then you get to micro for the million. So do you need to memorize this? Not quite, almost. What we want to memorize is not this whole colorful thing, as nice as it is. But just the initials. K for kilo, H, D for hecto and deca. The unit goes here, D for DESA, CEM, dot, dot, and micro for CENTA. So this, this we need, yeah. And we're never going to have an answer that ends in hecto or deca or DESA, but we still need the letters, and we're about to see why. So your job is to memorize some saying. The traditional one in textbooks is King Henry does usually drink chocolate milk you being per unit. That's a terrible one because the English sense, you can reverse the drink and usually and it makes just as much sense to your brain. 
So that doesn't actually help you remember the order of these in a reliable way. So the best that my past math 20 students have come up with was killer hobos dance under dazzling crystal wheels. <laughs> Again, it stops here. You're not doing your dot dot math home. K H D U D C M. So feel free to make up your own. If it's catchy, I'll put it here on the website and you'll be famous forever. <laughs> And again, when I say whenever we do finally have a test, go, then you're going to not only write the parts of a gallon picture at the top of your test, but your scratch paper, you're probably going to go KD, KHD, VCM, not not micro, and put that at the top so it's handy and you'll have downloaded it from your brain. Okay, why do we care about this? I'm telling you, you need to memorize this and be able to write it out real quick. So let's see what usefulness it is. There is a shortcut. When we're converting between the metric, the SI prefixes, we're going to write that list I just had you write, and then we count to decimal point scoops. So for every place that you move on that list, you will just move the decimal point the same way. And if that doesn't make sense when I say it out loud, let's just do a bunch of them. So here is my list, K, H, D, U, D, C, M, dot, dot, micro. I just know I'm doing this kind of problem, so I write it on the board. Okay, let's do the first one. How many millimeters? So I'm starting at millimeters. This is the milla, right? is 2.8 centimeters. So I'm going to centimeters. So I am going one scoot to the left. So all I have to do is take my 2.8 and do one scoot to the left. And I'm done. This is why the rest of the world makes fun of Americans. Okay. <laughs> Screw them, we're awesome. Uh, I'm absolutely astounded. Back in the beginning of Obama's terms when they did all of these um, stimulus projects, they needed a bunch of things that didn't require a lot of skill to just pay people to do work. Why didn't we replace all the street signs with metric stuff and just move over then that would have been a great stimulus project but no okay anyway everyone okay with this let's do more they're quick oh by the way i should save this because every now and then it will just die and that makes me sad okay Right, as long as you're staying in the SI units. If it asks about inches, then we have to go back to the old thing of divide and multiply and find the conversion rate and all of that. Okay, a calculator is 16 centimeters long. Change this first to meters. Where's meters on this list? Yeah, meters is hiding here. It doesn't start with you, so be a little careful. So this one is two scoots to the left. And millimeters. So this one is one scoot to the right. Questions about either part of 83. 
Okay, ready to try your own and then I'll delay and do them after you've tried it. You try 84 and 85, and then I will do them on the board in a moment. But the second, DECI, D-E-C-I. But you don't actually need to know that. For now, it's just something in a list. Where would grams fall in this one? Yeah, grams is just the plain unit. That's where the U is. Okay, so for 84, 6,480 grams. So grams is going to be the plane unit. Where are we going to? Kilo, so that's over here. So one, two, three scoots to the left. One, two, three. Everyone okay with 84? Okay. And nope, that one I want. Yeah. Okay. Ah, here we have a translation issue with 85. What was the other name for cubic centimeters? We're not dealing with motorcycles and allergy shots, so we don't want to use cc's. What was the other name for that? Micro. Milliliters. The same number. Yes, a milliliter and a cubic centimeter is just two names for the same thing. So changing 450 cc, that actually is 450 milliliters. There's no difference at all. Don't make it harder than it is. But for the part two, we're actually going to have to move. So we're starting at milla. Where are we moving to? Liters, where is plain liters going to go? The U. Zero point four five. So one, two, Okay, everyone happy with all of these? Tell me to go back to a different slide if you need. Question? Okay, so. Well, if I have that. Yeah, this doesn't help you with pounds and ounces at all. It's only for when you start and okay, end so. in the metric system. Everything that falls underneath you, what is everything that falls underneath you? Liters, grams, and meters are the ones we use. There are others in the world like watts. Right? When you get your electric bill, that's kilowatts. Yep. So, I'm just saying so that if I do this diagram, then I'll know those are all underneath you. So 
Yeah, the ones we use are meters, liters, and grams. So anything on this side of it, of the whatever the number is, you just get the decimal to the left. And if it's on the other side, you just get it to the right. Um, it depends on where you're starting and where you're ending. Just because you have milliliters doesn't tell me which direction to see. Am I starting in milliliters and going? No, but straight? yeah. Well, what I'm saying is, if you need to go to milliliters and you want to go over to the liters, you're going to move it to the left. Yes. Okay. And if I wanted okay. to go micro, I would move it to the right. Yes. So depending on whatever. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Oh yes. Sorry, typo. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Good fix. Okay. Should we do one with micro just so that you've seen micro in action? It's exactly the same, but let's do it. But then do you have to add those other two spots that are up there? Yes. So let's say you're at the pharmacy having to do something and you have 0.4 milligrams is how many it's mcg is micrograms okay where are we starting on our blue list? We're starting on the M. We're starting on the M. We're going to the micro. So one, two, three scoots. One, two, three. So it's going to be 400. That's why it's so awkward that Nobody ever invented names for these because you still have to use, them, have to use them for this group thing. That makes sense. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so today should have been good news. We have multiplying and dividing to change things from inches to feet or miles to feet or whatever. And Dividing and multiplying isn't too hard. We have a trick on when to multiply and when to divide based on if we're going smaller to bigger or bigger to smaller. And then if we're in the SI system and staying in the SI system, we even have this nice little scooting thing so we don't have to do all of that. So bigger to the left, smaller to the right. Okay. One more quick topic. Exponents and square roots. I want to think about these a little more carefully, even though you know about what exponents are from other math classes. If I have a square, I need to make this a little smaller. Uh, okay. Then, how big is this square in area? If I was to paint it, we would say it's a square foot. Area is length times width. One times one is one. Or we could just look at it and say that thing is a square foot. If I change the feet to inches, on this edge, I break it up into 12 inches. On this edge, I break it up into 12 inches. Now, each one of these little things is a square inch. So how many square inches would be in the whole thing square? 144, 12 times 12. You could count them, but we'll just trust that we, 12 times 12 is 144. Everyone okay with that? So this is partly a reminder when we get to geometry that sometimes you'll have to do more than one unit conversion in a geometry problem. Just a heads up, keep it in the back of your brain for when we get there. But it's also a warning that people might write this like one, um, sorry, 144 inches squared. Have you ever seen that? Yeah. yeah. I will try to always write when lecturing 
144 square inches. But you are welcome to use the other one. This is just a lecturing politeness kind of issue like so many other things you've talked about, the zero point in the front and so on. So what is wrong with the inches squared for lecturing that when you're following along, these two things look very similar. If I have two squared feet, I'm going to just make it bigger so you can see it in the back of the room. This is a length. I am walking forward four feet. If I have the other one, two feet squared, then this is an area. I need enough paint to fill two of those one by one tiles. So they're totally different things, even though they might look a little bit the same, because they both have a two and an exponent two and a foot. So that's my exponent warning. Everyone okay with that? Okay. It's going to trip someone up later this term, but then I'll have this to point back to and say, I told you to be careful. Backwards of exponents is square roots. The square root of 25 is 5, because if I have a side that's 5, that gets me to the 25 I started with. We often use that square root symbol, but just because we have the symbol, don't forget the definition. If I say, what's the square root of 144, then you can say 12, because we just did that one, right? If I say, what's the square root of 9, you can say 3, because 3 times 3 is 9. So don't assume you have to rush and get your calculator all the time. Sometimes you can just remember the picture, the definition of square root, and get the answer more quickly. The nice ones have a name. The numbers like 4 and 9 and 16 we call perfect squares. They are the ones where the edge length would be a whole number. If I had a square and the area was 8, well, if it was 9, that would be 3 and 3. If it was 4, that would be 2 and 2. So it's somewhere between 2 and 3 of an edge length, but it's a decimal. I don't know what it is. In this class, you can always just take out your calculator, use your square root key, see what square root of 8 is. That's fine. In fact, Math 60 wants you to be able to do that so badly, it's even going to be a problem on the final. You just use your square root key and get that problem right. So. And that is the end. Ta-da. So we are now all done with that first shape-shifting chapter. We've talked about everything anyone at LCC cares about for, isn't that strong? It has to be smaller to fit. There we go. So we've done all these things. Anything we can do with only one number, we've talked about now. So, great job, yay. We can move things from format to format, fractions, percents, decimals. We've talked about rounding and when a bunch of decimal points are just garbage because of the math and not what anyone really measured. Then we can move between measurement units when we need to. So we will get more interesting because dealing with one number at a time is kind of boring. But now we're done with that. Part, so. Okay, and I have a couple minutes for attendance and then